everybody. Time for some more Fatal 12. Well, I'm doing a little early morning recording session before I get things started here. Not a whole lot to comment on. Things are moving fast right now, aren't they? We've uh, formed a very strange alliance, followed by an even stranger alliance. And all for the purposes of, well, for the most part, taking down number four. Although everyone wants to take down everyone else too, while also simultaneously covering their own butts. In other words, business as usual. But we are going to be trying to take down four with the help of Alan and Odette and our brand new handgun. So this should be interesting. Uh, again, we've got some fairly strange dynamics in the sense that we can't be hurt, which puts us in an interesting position. We had some we had an interesting time with Mao, who also noticed a few things. We got to play with her for a bit. And uh, the usual bit about bags being found in different locations. And it's possible that this whole Tokyo Tower thing is a false flag. That the bombs are going to be planted somewhere else, and Four is just going to be here to have a chat with our girl, Rinka. Pretty much all bets are off. Uh, like I was saying before, it was pretty easy to predict what uh, Four was going to do. To hurt Naomi and call out Rinka, and still kind of surprised he survived that. But now we are in crazy territory. I think the only thing we can be sure about is I'm fairly certain Four is not going to survive the next election. But uh, let's see about that. I'm very curious to see how this plays out. But we are at Tokyo Tower. We're going to get right into it. This is one of the most famous structures in Japan. And hopefully will still be by the end of the day. But it's very possible we're going to be blowing up some observatories. While it's 1,100 feet of height may fall short compared to the sky trees 2,100, it remains an illustrious sight among the cityscape. The observatory, perched 800 feet above ground, may require a fee, but one can easily see the entirety of Tokyo from it. Viewing the city from such a height truly gives a new perspective for what is found on the surface. It almost feels like staring into an entirely different world. Alan was kind of making points about this last video. Many people experience a wide range of emotions here. But one person stands out from the rest, one whose purpose is the complete opposite of theirs. The feelings experienced by the people who stare down at the world only serve to separate them from it. This is no time to let that influence him. He has to focus on what's to come. Oh, are we playing as four? Is this a perspective of four? That is all this person can think about. We're playing as... I was wondering if we were going to do this at some point. I guess it's now or never if he's a... If this is a Saturday and he's probably not going to survive tomorrow. We get to play as you. Okay. I hate it here. It is none other than you. The boy meant to lose his life upon carrying out a suicide attack on the Yamanote line, but for some reason didn't. His irritation comes not only from his sense of duty to alert the world to the plight of others, but also from his own emotions. We were going a little bit into the motivations of the terrorist group last stream because that was the stream, or the video I should say when we found out that they were going to do this attack in the first place, and just kind of what their motivations as a group were. Emotions he simply cannot control. They became an inseparable part of him the very moment they sprouted. It hurts. So I guess just the way he's been feeling, I guess in conflict with the way he's been raised, as opposed to how Shigetsugu kind of made him feel... That reality pains him. He glances at the phone provided to him by the organization and checks the news. Reports say that a number of bags with bombs inside have been found in the area. This is the news that Mao also saw. Investigations to determine the responsible party are currently underway. Connections are also being made to the attack on Amica Girls University High School, as the bombs found were of the same type used there. Everything's going well. The more security is concerned with what goes on away from here, the less attention they'll pay to him. Okay, so this isn't the diversion. The bombs are the diversion from this. Besides, he is well aware that very few people in this country would suspect a child of being responsible for a terrorist attack. They could never fathom that the things they see on the news are happening right next to them. I... 
He squeezes the bag he has hoisted in front of him tight. It is the very same bag he was once meant to use on the Yamanote line. The keychain attached to it is the one he picked himself. Oh, is that going to tie into his regret too? Because we, we remember noting that keychain when we just very first time we met him. And I believe we noted it one or two other times. However, the explosives within completely outclass those to be used back then. They are custom made by one of the organization's members, one whom you has yet to determine whether or not he should rely on to. He should refer to as an ally. They know the organization is on the brink of collapse, so they put all their knowledge and spirit to work. The explosion won't kill you, though. It won't even kill you. Countless people will die within one of the country's most famous landmarks. But among all the bodies, you will stand tall. Not being able to go out as a hero is somewhat disappointing to him, but the world won't have a choice but to take notice of these events. Of course, this isn't used true motive, yeah. I mean, he has to know that all this stuff is going to get undone if and when he gets voted out. I can't stop myself anymore. That's why you need to. And when you do, kill me. <laughs> Again, your, your name is, is amusing in these contexts. His words, while they fall on deaf ears, are directed to one specific person. I better get going. Yu lines up to purchase a ticket to the observatory, which he accomplishes with ease. It's somewhat rare for a child to come here alone, but not enough for anyone to suspect him. He is just a child, after all. The lady at the counter would never expect that a bomb sits within his bag. Up next is... Yu casts a glance toward the staff carrying out bomb checks. I was about to mention that. We talked about that last video, too, where they were talking about the fact that they do bomb checks before going to the observatories. There are two ways to reach the observatory. One is the emergency staircase, and the other is the elevator. The emergency staircase is open during the day for all to use. It should take around 15 minutes to reach the observatory by that route. That is a long-ass staircase. In order to maximize the number of casualties, both paths must be rendered unusable. That's, why the other, that's what the other members are for, however. The plan has already been put into motion. It's time. A hint of severity takes over his expression. His pupils widen like those of a wild beast. He makes his way to the baggage check line. In front of him is a child even smaller than him, alongside their parents. He makes sure not to look back in order to avoid suspicion, but behind him is also a girl around his age. Then again, Rinka looks around the same age as him, judging solely by height, so he cannot be certain of this. Not like these people matter to you. His only concern lay lays in whether or not he notices any participants, such as numeral 11. The family in front of him passes through the check without issue. Up next is you himself. The moment the staff approaches him, he moves on reflex. Uh-oh. Is it fight time? Is it go time? Oh, damn. Someone else brought a gun. He pulls out the gun he had kept hidden under his coat. A Glock 19. I just get a... <laughs> yeah. Boy, next patch you's getting buffed in uh, Blaze Blue here. Uh, do -do -do. It is both compact and simple to handle. This is no toy gun. It's as real as they come. What the hell? Um... Okay, first of all, why would a nobody get a sprite? Second of all, that ain't no nobody. Either someone reused the design, or that is very clearly Alan. Does you recognize him? I mean, he don't look very Japanese. Figures. He brings his left hand up to steady the gun before firing three shots into the staff member's gut. Is this Alan? Is this a reused asset, or is this Alan? Because it looks an awful lot like Alan. If it's Alan, the gun isn't going to do anything. The gunshots sound far less flashy than in the movies. The reason he avoided their head was simple. The staff member is a participant. Oh! So, yeah, you is, uh, you is sharp. So he's shooting to wound because he knows he can't kill him anyway. So he's just like, okay, well, F this guy. You knows that fate will intervene and prevent their death. You came to stop me after all. Yeah, that won't kill you, but it's going to sting like a bee. 
It is Alan Scorpion who's disguised himself as one of the tower's staff. How did you manage that exactly? How did you just show up for work and just be like, oh yeah, the other guy called in sick? He finds himself crouching on the ground as his reaction to use assault is a split second too late. It'll be interesting to hear the, the story behind this. The floor is painted red with his blood. Alan's physique is nothing to scoff at, but no amount of muscle can stop a bullet. The damage done will be minimal, due to the bullet being fired point blank, but it'll be enough, more than enough to render him immobile. Well, that's... Okay, so that's interesting, because you made a point of saying the girl behind him could was like Rinka's height or whatever. But that's... That's Rinka, isn't it? Rink, she's wearing that uh, that little outfit that I mentioned. It's like, ooh, stylish, last uh, last stream. But she also had the good sense to possibly be dyeing her hair or wearing a wig. The gold is gone. Huh. You waste no time with this opportunity. He reaches back and grabs the arm of the girl behind him, pulling her over to him and pointing the gun at her head. Is this going to be the catalyst to a conversation, or does you not realize that that's Rinka? Consider her a hostage. Ah, black-haired girl. Eh, she ain't that black-haired. I'll kill her if you stop this elevator. You has no issue whatsoever with killing non-participants. Okay, so perhaps he was fooled. No one among the crowd is gallant enough to try anything either. Every last one of them are paralyzed with fear after witnessing what just happened. They don't even run up to Alan to make sure he's okay. All they do is scream. Full-scale panic has already set in by the time the other staff, and those whose curiosity got the better of them, come to the scene. I wonder if Alan took those bullets willingly, knowing that they were just setting up for this. We'll be interested to see what his attitude is toward this later. The situation is too far beyond anyone's control at this point. Wait! Any normal person would have collapsed from the pain posed by those wounds. But Alan remains able to stare you dead in the eye. Split-second decisions are what the entire situation demands. You proceeds to take his phone out while keeping the girl close. This is necessary in order to ex execute his, or rather their, plan. Here we go. He navigates his way to and launches a streaming app. The account used for this particular stream is anonymous, but he has all the confidence in the world that the channel will spread like wildfire thanks to social media. I think this is how you do it. He has gone through the motions previously, but it is still hard for him to figure out. He turns the phone camera toward himself and makes sure he's in frame. Keeping an eye on what's going on around him, he makes a number of inputs before setting the stream to go live. <laughs> All the while, Rink is just standing here with a gun to her head. The title for the stream, which they had decided on earlier, is simple. The organization's name plus suicide bombing stream. I don't think Twitch would allow you to use that that seems like it would go against the terms of service there you might get flagged for that you opting not to rely on his card book speaks to the viewers in somewhat crude japanese ha look at this i am about to carry out a suicide bombing at tokyo tower plenty of viewers get hooked by the title alone that being said the comments are full of nothing but trolls okay, guys can we get a hype train going most are saying things along the lines of quit the act kid and nice publicity stunt lol some of the choice examples. This is why they should age gate the net, and this is some new viral marketing thing. The viewer count may have spiked initially, but many begin to leave after seeing the wave of incredulous comments. A huge surge has yet to happen. You pays no attention to the comment section, of course. I have a hostage. The gun is real. I shot the person over there with it. Eep. Even with that said, he still has a good idea of how people will react. Yeah, Rinka may know she'll survive this, but I don't think she's interested in getting shot at all. Maybe then the head won't work, but... Uh, his time spent watching TV at Shigetsugu's house wasn't for nothing. His unfamiliarity with streaming leads to him leaving himself out of frame at times, but he eventually turns the camera toward Alan. It's fine if you don't believe me. You're the type of people I'm doing this for in the first place. Ah, nice. This is a message for all you people who don't care about the world beyond your bubble. A message from those who suffer the most outside for, outside of it. You speak slowly to his audience. He figures the stream will be perceived as legitimate after showing both the gun and someone who's been shot by it. 
There will be people who still think it's fake, but also those who will spread it under the belief it's all real. Not to mention the possibility of people at the scene currently... Not to mention the possibility of people at the scene currently watching? Hmm. Possibility of them believing it? I don't know. I'm not into that sentence. The general population comes to realize that it is real, though. The view, the viewer counts continue climb, continued climb is proof of that. The admins likely aren't aware of the stream yet, but you knows they will be unable to cut it off, even when they do take notice. I don't know. I still think you're breaking the TOS. Some of you may have connected the dots already, but let me make it clear. I'm the one responsible for the bombing at Amaka Girl University's high school. That makes me the one responsible for the death of an innocent girl. Of course, you only believe her to be innocent, but if you ask me, anyone without any concern for the world at large is anything but innocent. Even if you watch and read upon the news, that's little more than an excuse. Rink is just taking this. Let's talk about me for a bit. You lowers the tone of his voice a bit. Are we going to get a, a cinema scene or something? Are we back to Mao? We are back to Mao. Oh, she's watching the stream. Interesting. Interesting. What the hell? Is this really happening in Japan? Mao poses the question to herself as she watches the stream. The fact that it's happening right after she learned about the bombs that were found earlier takes her by surprise. The boy has both a gun and a hostage. Is she going to recognize the hostage? Rink has done something about her hair, either dyed it or wear a wig, but Mao may recognize her. What's more, he's already used the gun on someone. His intent to make his way up to the observatory and set off an explosion has been made clear. Maybe she'll comment Rinka in the comments and he'll see that and be like, wait, what the hell? Mao cannot believe this is occurring in Japan of all places. The boy makes it very clear that he's doing this for people like her, those who can't quite believe this is really happening. Mao is unable to consider herself a mere bystander in all this, though. Uh, why not? Don't go there. He's the culprit? Uh, he's the one that killed Naomi? He just claimed responsibility for what happened in Amica. That makes him the one responsible for Naomi's death. Yeah, and he was talking shade about her, too, saying she was not innocent. Naomi wasn't just an underclassman to Mao. She was a close friend. Let's talk about me for a bit, okay? We're coming in. The boy switches the topic to himself as Mao and the rest of Japan watches. This is a moment she has to pay attention to. <laughs> is she going to recognize this? I'm pretty sure that's Rinka. She's wearing Rinka's stuff. Life in the country I was born in was the complete opposite to what the people of Japan are used to. Even the name of my country wouldn't ring a bell for you. Every day was a fight for survival. My father died before I was born, while my mother died soon after. My... While my bother... My father died before I was born, while my bother died soon after. That could be brother, that could be mother. Maybe it's just someone they don't like. Ah, oh, my bother. What a bother they died soon after. Game. Game. Fix. I spent my life alone right from the beginning. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, you. You've really broken the tension in your stream here. And it's, it's, the only reason I was able to survive was due to a certain institution I was taken into. But they were a bother, too. The institution was a hospital that doubled as an orphanage. It was full of children like you. Orphans who had no one to take care of them. There was a Japanese woman there who we called Mama. She worked as a doctor in the afternoons and at the orphanage the rest of the time. According to him, this lady also used her spare time to train new doctors. Not only was this place rife with conflict, it was also far from sanitary. There simply weren't enough doctors to take care of all the patients. What's more, she took as much time as possible to look after the children as well. We were able to live thanks to her efforts. She even took the time to make food for us every now and then. At the time, yeah, that's his mom's home cooking. At the time, being around her helped me to understand what it must be like to have a mother. There's a limit to how much one person can do on their own, though. Physically, mentally, and financially. Medical treatment requires proper funding. There's no limit to where the expenses can go. Medicine, equipment, personnel, etc. The institution itself couldn't run without that funding either. They needed an incredible amount of money just to provide the most basic of necessities. The number of patients and orphans only increased. As such, both the hospital and institution constantly lacked the money to run properly. Mama sought aid from Japan, her home country. Of course, they wouldn't provide her the money she needed. Money gathered by nonprofit organizations to aid such places existed, but it wasn't enough. That money wasn't provided solely for their institution, either. 
No place on earth is able to provide infinite funding. In the end, the people there opted to ask you for help by setting up a funding service on the internet. You're all aware of how that went, aren't you? We barely received anything, and Mama eventually died from being overworked. That was akin to losing his own mother. If he says too much on here, he's going to give away his regret, and everyone's going to get it, and Rink is going to be the one to vote him off. But it'll be funny for Bad Glows, and she'll be like, well, that was easy, and she leaves, and we'll be like, wait, what? For the institution itself, they had lost the one major pillar supporting it. Mama used to say that the kindness of Jap Japanese people would make things work out. They would come to the aid of a fellow countryman no matter what. The people of this country would feel for her plight as she worked hard in a far-off land. She truly believed in the people of her homeland. I believed her words because they came from her. It was all a lie, though. You people didn't care. Not about my country and not about Mama. Yu runs down the events in his life that have led up to now. This is a long stream. That's just... Mao struggles to find the right words. Based on his age, Mao had been born during that whole ordeal. Despite this, she had no clue that any of what he just said had happened. The fact that he had brought a fellow Japanese into the equation settled things. I mean, she hates this boy for what he did to Naomi. Just thinking about him makes her angry. Still, she finally realizes that she should direct that anger at herself, too. Age is of no consequence here. The general apathy of the public killed that woman. None of it serves to part in the actions that resulted in Naomi's death, though. It is, however, a fact that Mao has no means to refute his claims. Aw, oh, she feels bad. I mean, okay, fine, fair enough, but still, this is, uh... This is still a terrorist attack, and you should probably not. Everyone there listens to you attentively. After that, I became a mercenary, though I was treated more like a disposable tool. I took out any and all opponents with ease. I was talented in the art of war, a natural marksman. I did what I did because I had no choice. His continued survival may not have been what he desired. Survival on the battlefield only yields the death of others. All this even after Mama's efforts to teach him compassion. As such, he disposed of his emotions in order to get used to the idea of killing others. The bits of emotions left over from the process remained sealed and hidden within him. Also, he could progress forward without losing his sense of self. In exchange, he found a new reason to carry on. It was only ever taught... I was only ever taught one thing after that, become a hero. So it was his regret that he couldn't become a hero. He speaks of how they taught him that people can become heroes in death, about how they can offer their lives up for the sake of their beliefs. In doing so, no one can claim they are wrong. Well, that's some indoctrination. Dying in order to protect what's important to them is the one true way for people to become heroes. I came to realize that Mama had become a hero in her death. She stuck to her values till the very end. That's why I wanted to become a hero myself. I eventually ended up at Null's Japan branch, thanks to telling one of their leaders about my past when I came to Japan. The fight against these countries' indifference was a bit difficult for me to understand, but it resonated with me nonetheless. I could become a hero while getting my revenge on the world. Saying that, Yu tugs his hostage over toward the elevator. My comrades should have the observatory under their command now. Don't bother using the emergency stairway either. I have other people stationed there as well. Leaving that warning behind, he makes his way to the elevator. His phone is pointed away from his face once inside. He doesn't want the stream to notice his pained expression as the door closes. I mean, Rink is gonna care that you went through this pain and hell and stuff. Still gonna stop you, though. The girl he had taken hostage cries the entire way up. She is visibly shaking, too. Yu feels no compa compassion whatsoever for her. You know, Yu's usually on the ball about stuff, so I'm curious, does he not genuinely not realize? She's about to die, so why should he? If he feels anything toward her, it's gratitude that she hadn't made much of a fuss otherwise. The observatory is a mere one-minute ride on the elevator away. Yu spends this time reflecting on the past he just spoke about. The idea of people getting emotional over a story does nothing but annoy him. Has anyone in this country gone through the same miserable experience as him? He hates those who consider themselves different from the masses because they feel a speck of concern over events like the ones he spoke of. It means nothing if no effort is made to change things. 
The elevator continues to climb to the t the tower as he ponders this. Nah, we'll make a TikTok video for you. We'll, we'll make a dance. Before long, they reach the observatory. After a brief flora announcement, the elevator door opens. What are you doing, the girl? Upon departing the elevator, he finds himself staring down the muzzle of a gun. Oh, hello! Rinku was just like, oh, hi. Oh, nope, never mind, it's the other one. A woman with a freakishly muscular body is pointing a high-caliber revolver between his eyes. He should know who this is. It's, yep, none other than numeral 11, against whom he had fought previously. Don't you notice I have a hostage? Yeah, about that. Your little game's over, kid. A gunshot rings out. Yu was convinced his comrades were waiting for him. That led to him letting his guard down. He hadn't received word about this, either. That's why he wasn't able to move before the gunshot went off. He remains unscathed, however. She had named for him. Instead, her target was the phone he had been using to stream the events. The phone is flung back into the elevator as it breaks apart in midair. Yu wastes no time in readying the same gun he shot Alan with immediately after. Remember, I have a host... Yeah, about that. What's this pose? You having a dance-off? Where are you going? A familiar voice shouts from beside him. The person said voice belongs to takes out a gun of their own, but doesn't shoot. Instead, they use it as a blunt device, swinging it at the hand Yu is holding his own with. Too slow, Yu evades, making sure to keep his bag safe as well. When the girl's swing misses, she's bent over and wide open to retaliation. A black substance... A black substance's oozes onto the floor from her hair. Ah, she's dyed it. Underneath the ooze, gold streaks reveal themselves. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> that way we don't have to draw a new sprite. You're... Shishimai Rinka. Ta-da! You pieces together the hostage he took was her in disguise. Why is my clothes covered in black crap? Oh, although surprised, his movements are not affected. He reflexively fires his weapon at her. However, dealing with two opponents in a closed space like this proves reckless, even for him. Hey, Rinka may be a rookie, but Odette ain't. Odette gets a grip on his clothes and violently pulls him toward her. The shots fired at Rinka go astray as a result, piercing right through the elevator ceiling. Odette takes aim at his back with her own gun. The space between his back and his bag, to be precise. She fires off two shots, both hitting the shoulder straps of his bag. Ah, see, Odette is capable. And she knows better than shoot at someone that ain't gonna die. Whoa! One slight miscalculation would have resulted in hitting the bomb concealed within the bag. Fate may have kept them alive, but they still would have been seriously injured from an explosion at such close proximity. Well, you wasn't. Odette's marksmanship ensures she hits her target and severs the bag from you. Whose perspective are we... I guess we're just third-person everyone here. <laughs> There's this shot again. This is, this is just how I celebrate. She does this because she knows just how much damage the bomb could cause. Yu redirects his attention toward the bag so as not to drop it. He's fine with himself getting hurt. But there wouldn't be enough victims were the bomb to go off here. His decision to prioritize the bag is the exact opposite of Odette's. She delivers a swift, powerful kick to his back while his eyes are glued to the floor. Being almost double his weight, Odette's kick sends him flying. Yeah, here's that rematch I was wondering about. Odette grins from ear to ear as she sees him take to the air. Yeah, oh yeah. Let's let's beat the crap out of this kid just for fun. Why not? She isn't even concerned about the bag. Watch out! Little action shot of Rinka twirling like a ballerina. I'm not even sure what this is supposed to be. Rinka tosses her gun and lunges for the bag. She goes in head first, arms fully extended. The impact against the floor would likely cause the bomb to go off. Would it? Is that how bombs work? I mean, bombs technically have to be pretty safe because you don't want them to detonate prematurely and what have you. That realization was, is what causes her to jump without a moment's thought. She manages to catch the bag with both hands as both her body and her face continue to skid across the floor. While she's able to prevent the bomb from going off, her face now feels like it's been peeled away from her skull. Why is this happening? Because you got found out, son. The bomb has been stolen from him mere, mo mere moments before he could accomplish his goal. His outcry is the result of letting his emotions take control. It's the only thing left he can do. And it was probably the scariest moment of my life. My? Who's my? Are we, are we Rinka again? 
A bag with a bomb inside almost crashed onto the floor. I would have had to bear the brunt of the explosion had I failed to catch it. Okay, we're Rinka again. We've just switched to first person when I wasn't looking. But it's an experience I've been through once before. I wouldn't have died this time, but who knows how badly I would have been burnt. My face would have been unrecognizable. I mean, you keep being worried about this, but you set off a bomb right next to himself and just didn't give two craps. My actions helped us pull through the initial phase of our plan. That much I'm confident about. There's a bomb in here, damn it! Don't just ignore it! <clears throat> she yelling for the sake of other people around? Oh, just a little dad. Oh, my bad. Throwing a feint was the only way I could get it away from him, so glad you knew what to do after that. <laughs> just, no dad doesn't give a damn. I'd normally be surprised to see that she's still smiling during all this, but now I know that this is what she lives for. Things are going just as we planned. Yeah, when's the conversation? Why are you two the only ones here? Uh, Team 9 may be somewhere around here. Alan is nursing his wounds. There are no traces of any customers nor used comrades. We are the only three here. Oh, maybe that's what 9 got up to. Oh, hmm, well, we did your little buddies in. I was hoping they'd be as strong as you, but nah, just a bunch of small fry. There were ten of them. Numbers ain't no thing when they're all pushovers. But if there were even three people like you, then we'd have been in trouble. I told them all about you, so why did they let you through? You couldn't have forced your way through without causing a stir. What's more, they kept in contact with me and never mentioned anything. Aw, oh, you didn't notice? That was me sending those messages. I played you, because I had to. There was every chance you'd go wild right at the entrance if I took down your pals and evacuated everyone. You're bound to round up a good number of casualties no matter where you blow yourself up in Tokyo. That's why we made this plan to take the bomb away from him. So this is the stuff they were discussing last night. His lack of consideration for his own life made things far more difficult to handle than they would normally. I was worried when Odette said she would handle all his comrades, but she really did manage to pull it off. You know the rest, I'm sure. We're going to beat the shit out of you and get you to talk. I told you that I don't plan on dying so easily, didn't I? He directs that line straight at me. Then he raises his gun and points it my way. Ah! But I'm not his target. It's most likely the bomb. I was about to say... Taking his focus off Odette proves to be a mistake, though. She's the one to let that slip past her. Making use of the reach provided by her height advantage, she launches another kick right at his jaw before he can fire. You barely dodges in time, but Odette doesn't let up. She continues with an unrelenting barrage of punches and kicks. Uh, she's using her infinite combo. How about this? He whips out a knife with his left hand. Odette backsteps. She must figure she'll get slashed if she tries to kick him again. You take his advantage of her hesitation by tripping her up with a left leg sweep. Rinka should just grab the bomb and hide it around a corner or something. So it can't at least be shot. It causes her to lose balance, but she manages to kick him in the stomach during her fall. Yu remains armed even after that and fires his weapon at her. That dreadful bang echoes across the observatory. Well, you're going to run out of bullets soon. That's three in Alan, four at her. He fires four consecutive shots. It makes the exact same sound as when he shot Alan earlier. Regardless, not one shot hits Odette because her kick because her kick before has knocked him off balance. Okay. I'll let you get away with that sentence. I was a little bit confused at first. There's a distinct clang as the bullets ricochet off the floor. Both of them collapse on the ground. Yu is the first to spring back up, likely due to a smaller frame. He readies his knife and flings it at Odette. As soon as he throws it, he chases it st <laughs> straight toward her. Odette doesn't have time to get back up and instead opts to draw her gun while prone. She fires the same moment I notice her action. Yu does the same. The sounds of both guns going off overlaps. Are we going to help? We're just going to hug the bomb. His shot is directed at neither me nor Odette, though. Maybe because he's firing while at a full sprint. Or he's firing at the bomb. Meanwhile, Odette's shot somehow connects with the knife he had thrown, which causes it to twirl up toward the ceiling. Well, that's pretty cool. You're going to have to imagine all this, guys. I hope you're, uh, you're just eyes closed. It's like, oh, yeah, it seems like a pretty cool fight scene. Yu's shot bounces off a small crevice in the floor, sending it straight to Odette's hand. That's what I think, anyway. It barely misses her hand and strikes her gun instead. It breaks apart and flies across the room. That's one flimsy gun. Not bad, but we ain't done yet. One down, one to... Oh, one down, one to go. That was Yu. Yu points his gun at Odette. Here's your toy back! Flung, yep, throws the knife. For a brief moment, I'm unable to discern what's happened. For some reason, Yu lets his gun fall to the floor. Shortly after that, I notice blood dripping down to his right hand. Eek! 
with my own knife. His words helped me to pierce it all together. Odette must have caught the knife she deflected earlier, and she threw it back at him just in time. Anyway, back to business. What's that sound? It's a send up the police. Woot, woot. The faint ringing of police sirens can be heard from the surface. That should be no surprise. I'm amazed it's taken them this long to arrive. Were you guys not watching the stream? Considering the gravity of this situation, it may not be just the regular police and fire brigade either. The riot police may have also come. Having noticed this, Yu snatches up his gun and sprints toward the door leading to the emergency stairs. You ain't getting away. Where is Nine's group in all this? Were they diverted? Were they distracted? Did they have bad info? Are they doing something else? He fails to anticipate that the stair will be will the stairwell will be blocked off by a certain someone, however. Did Alan get back on his feet? Did Rinka manage to pull that off? I don't think she'd pose much of an obstacle. Is it nine? Oh, no, nope. Alan's back on his feet. You even got a chance to change. You were bluffing as well? Oh, was he wearing like a bulletproof vest or something? You must figure everything out in that moment. Alan disguised himself as one of the staff, but he had counted for the possibility of getting shot. With that in mind, he made sure to wear a bulletproof vest and tape additional plating around the part of his stomach that was most likely to be targeted. Apparently, he went with rubber plating to ensure the sound wouldn't give away the fact that he was okay. The blood was fake, too. He had gotten a hold of some previously. Ah, we're all over you, you. All of this, including myself being taken hostage and Odette neutralizing him, was part of the plan. I wasn't able to do anything once they were locked in combat, but that was also expected. All I had to do was make sure the bomb didn't go off. You have two options. Come with us willingly, or we will force you to do so. Not only is you injured, but Alan also has his own gun on him. Most importantly, you is now trapped between two monsters. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, I was talking before about the chances of you being able to take on these guys one-on-one. -on -one. He held his own against a debt. But I think Odette came out on top, and now both of them are here? Yeah, you, uh... I'd rather not go at all. That said, Yu fires off a number of shots before Alan and Odette have the chance to react. Every single shot pierces the fire extinguishers placed throughout the observatory. Ah. Trixie, a smokescreen, huh? Quick thinking. Save the compliments for later. That bomb is still an issue. It takes a little more than a moment for the entire room to be cloaked in white smoke. I'll be taking this back, the bomb. Yu's voice comes from in front of me while I struggle to see what's going on. The weight of the bag suddenly gets lifted from my arms. He took the bag! We'll settle this score with fate tomorrow morning. Really? What happens tomorrow morning? Was there a comment about another terrorist? I can't remember. I don't have time to respond. I'm too busy panicking about what to do. We've done all we can for now. Let's make our escape now, too. Would have been a lot easier without all the crappy rules. Alan takes my hand in his before dragging me along with them because I'm still too shaken up to move on my own. What happens tomorrow morning? Well, that was fun. After the initial surprise of the stream suddenly cutting out, Mao switches over to news sites for up-to-date information. The situation is still somewhat unclear, but it seems like they've failed to blow up Tokyo Tower. However, the girl who was taken hostage had vanished. It's entirely possible that she's still being kept as a hostage. Amongst all this, Mal finds herself worried over something. I'm pretty sure I heard Rinny's voice. She could hardly believe it herself, but Mal was confident that she wouldn't mistake the voice of a close friend. <laughs> Did you mistake her as you were looking at her because her hair was dyed? That makes the unread messages she sent all the more concerning. Yeah, we're a little busy to read your tweets here, sorry. Things get crazy at Tokyo Tower thanks to the police and fire brigade's arrival. We are able to make our escape while the police are busy arresting Yu's comrades. Fortunately, we could get out via the emergency staircase with relative ease thanks to the flood of people entering the place. Once out, we make our way back to our base in Yokohama. Here. Oh, thank you. She hands me a bag filled with fast food. We could have just met at Lion House. Why the hell not, right? A burger and fries, to be precise. Next to her sits a bottle of alcohol she got from a convenience store, of course. I take a bite of the comically oversized burger. The viscous ketchup and warm meat fills my mouth. The overwhelming flavors are somehow more delicious than I remember. Maybe it's due to how tired I am. Come to think of it, this is the first time I've eaten today. 
My heart's still racing from all that's gone down. I guess I never had time to think about it, let alone actually get some food. See, this is why I like living life on the edge. Isn't this fun? Come on, you want to go knock over a bank tomorrow? You hasn't been arrested, as expected. Ain't no one who can get away from me like that gonna get caught by the police. Odette munches away at her burger and fries while she responds. I figured her palate would match her taste and knowledge for coffee, but nope, she just seems to love the act of eating. Yeah, she'll eat pretty much anything. I mean, look at those teeth. She can eat pretty much anything. There's something pleasant about the glee with which she does so. Especially when you factor in that this is her third burger. <laughs> her third burger? Jesse. Got a, Oh, her third burger, like, just now? <laughs> Gotta hand it to you, your acting wasn't half bad. If something needs to be done, then one simply has to do it. That explains your then explain your bravado. It hurt less than I anticipated. Care to give it a shot? Nah, I'm good. Can't promise that I wouldn't fire back. I wasn't able to get user regret card. He turned out to be a much tougher opponent than I assumed. I did get to hear about his past though. Yeah, that should give some uh, some hints. But of course it gives the same hints to everyone else, because it was a live stream. I'm finally able to understand the foundation behind his and his organization's beliefs. How are things looking after that little speech of his? A good chunk of the internet is discussing his past right now. Of course, most of the people are calling him out on it. From what I can see, there are plenty of people who sympathize with him, too. It's safe to say his stream worked. All the news channels are reporting on what happened today. While it's fortunate that there were no victims, the influence it's having on the world at large can't be understated. Fate has plenty of work in its plate once he gets eliminated. Yeah. If things get reworked that he died during a suicide attack on the Yamanote line, which would have been like a month and a half ago, then it's likely that both his attack on Amaka and what happened today will be undone. Society has become far more alert due to the recent string of attacks. People are even starting to feel bad for the perpetrators after seeing Yu's stream. His actions instilling fear in a great number of people have no doubt affected society as a whole. Will that be undone through his elimination as well? We won't know until it happens. The question now is what to do since he got away. Ain't an easy thing to track him down either. None of my connections know his location. Null's Japan branch is all but dead at this point, but he still has a bomb at his disposal. He only needs the one to claim a significant number of lives. Today's events won't stop him. He'll make his move tomorrow. What makes you say that? I swallow a chunk of my burger before continuing. You said that we'd settle things with fate tomorrow morning. He wouldn't say that and then stay put. Well then. That's all he said, though. I don't know what he's got planned. Chances are he'll go for Tokyo Tower again. Pulling it off while they've got security up the ass there will have way more impact. I figure that to be the likely scenario myself. He'd go back? Really? Is that wise? His beliefs are steadfast, yet they don't tie into his desire for me to kill him. He's been oddly focused on the idea of settling the score with fate, too. What does he mean by that? Does he mean... Yeah, what is that going to mean? Does that even mean with Parka specifically? Like, he's going to have certain beliefs around fate that he mentioned regarding all the stuff that's happened to him. Does that color his attitude toward people like Parka as well? We'll make our way to Tokyo Tower early in the morning. That's our best course of action, given in, given the limited information at our disposal. Both by itself and Audette nod in agreement. We take some time to rest up after we finish eating. Unfortunately, I can't go home now that I that we know Yu's plans on making his move tomorrow. Well, I'm probably best off not going back anyway. Audette took care of Tokyo Tower's security cams, but the police may come to question me on the off chance there's footage of me. I still got a gun on me, so they'd probably arrest me on the spot. Uh, today was a whole new experience for me. Yep, it's left me absolutely exhausted. Thinking back, it's a miracle that I came out of it unscathed. That's how crazy it was. It's a miracle they all came out unscathed. There were bullets flying all over the place. There is a public bathhouse about 20 minutes away on foot, so the three of us make the trek to get washed up. Sure, I built up a bit of a sweat on the way back, but considering the state I was in before the bath, it's worth it. Once we return, we go straight to sleep. We're going to be getting up just as early as we did today. What's more, tomorrow is likely to take even more of a toll on us, considering we don't know what you's planning. Odette falls asleep first this time, probably because she was drinking. Do we get to chat with Alan this time? 
But knowing her, she's probably she'd probably spring right up if you even thought about approaching her. I wouldn't be surprised. Not after witnessing her fight with you this afternoon. Yep, we're gonna have a chat with you. Or, uh, Alan. Are you still awake? Yeah. You should get him as much sleep as you can. That's all he says before he covers his face again. I want to thank him for accepting the role he took on today, but I hold my tongue. We're just using one another for our own benefit. He didn't do it for my sake. This is the same guy who took babies as hostages. Yeah, I can't forget that. Just as I try to fall asleep, he poses a question to me in a hushed tone. Do you think it's a sin to kill others? A question that doesn't even need an answer at that. Even so, I reply with a nod. Then do you also think it's a sin to eliminate others in divine selection? I'd say that yeah, it is. Uh, this is an interesting question because technically we're all dead anyway. All we're doing is just deciding whether or not we live. Both Naomi and myself treated it that way whenever we talked about divine selection. But now Naomi's gone. I don't have any choice but to commit that sin if I want to get her back. I don't see it that way. Eliminating someone the way we do simply puts them back on their initial path. I kind of agree with Alan on this one. Surviving this through the end and stepping off that path may in fact be the one true sin. Although I suppose that would make the act of eliminating others a sin in retrospect. His own statements are contradictory. What are you trying to say? I found myself thinking about it lately is all. Huh? His response doesn't even come close to answering my question. He doesn't say another word, though. I realize something important just as I'm about to fall asleep, though. The Alan I've come to know isn't the type of person to say a thing like that. In that case, why would he let me see this other side of him? I just can't figure it out. Alan is still a bit of a mystery. He is very ruthless, and regardless of that comment, he was still very fast to vote out number six. Like, he didn't even listen to all the rules. He was just like, you're out. But uh, it'll be it'll be curious to hear a little bit more about him. I know we're back. Why we're back here? It's so we can reuse the assets. We go back to Tokyo Tower the next morning. You know, this is the only place that exists. We don't have backgrounds for anywhere else, so this is where he's going. Unsurprisingly, the observatory is closed off. Only the aquarium and a small number of shops are still open. Hard to blame them, considering what happened. Are we you again? They might have failed, never mind. But anything involving hostages, gunshots, and a hostage who's gone missing is a big deal. I say that as someone who actually knows what went down, too. Are we Rinka? But really, the biggest surprise to me is that they didn't shut the entire place down. I guess it might be their way of saying they won't give in to terrorism. Maybe it's Mao. He ain't gonna get much out of whatever he tried to pull in this state. It won't stop him, though. He wouldn't mention settling things with fate if he didn't have something else planned. Try and think. Is there anywhere else he's likely to turn up? The school wouldn't matter, because it's a Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. Where else would you go? I guess he just head for population centers. It's not like this place has any particular attachment. He poses his question in a composed manner. There is a certain strength behind it, too. Nothing like the weak side he let slip yesterday. I honestly don't know, though. Times like this demand that I think things through from the beginning. Starting with the connection between me and you. <laughs> the connection between me and you. Maybe he'll go for a train again? Naomi was at the core. I mean, the train would be poetic, considering that's how this whole thing started. Maybe that'll be it. He took her life at Amica. All for the sake of making me eliminate him. I'm still not sure why he wants me to do it. However, I'm sure he left me a hint within that speech of his yesterday. Become a hero through death. Giving one's life to accomplish something earns one the title of hero. That's what he was saying. Why am I the one he's so focused on then? There are others who could eliminate him, so... A spark of fire lights up in my mind all of a sudden. Fire like the one that engulfed us both back then. The fateful exchange that had overheard us... Fire like the one that engulfed us both back then, the fateful exchange that it overheard us have. Okay, I, I can't even decipher that one. You won't become a hero. You're not even human. You're just a puppet. I was the one bold enough to proclaim that to him with my dying breath. Don't tell me. My thoughts lead me to the most logical conclusion. Train? 
one that proves to be the closest to finding the answer I've been looking for. I turn to face Odette and Alan. Let me handle this alone. What? I'm going to settle things with fate myself. Did something come to mind? I look Alan in the eyes and nod firmly. It's obvious they'll say no to me. I can't explain my reasoning, though. They'll get a hold of too much of my information if I do. Yeah, that's. I was kind of thinking that as well. If it does turn out to be the train, then that's going to raise questions. Specifically about, well, why would you know about a bomb at a train? Oh. Actually, they'll probably come along even if I give them a vague explanation. There's no guarantee I'm right, but it's not like they have any other leads. They don't have much of a choice. I can't let them come, though. I won't be able to reach the answer I'm looking for if I don't do this on my own. Yeah, now Odette will say okay. Alan, maybe, but Odette will be like, ah, sure, F it. Whatever, go for it. That ain't the face of someone who's going to bail. Agreed. He peers deep into my eyes before offering his consent. A brief pause follows before he closes his own eyes and continues. We'll do our own digging. As of now, our alliance has ended. Heh, <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a kick out of working with you two. Hmm. Are you sure? Let's assume you're plan you plan to flee. Do you think you would be able to escape us? Good. That's the attitude I expect from you. You sure have gotten snide, haven't you? Says the person responsible for it. When next we meet, we shall be enemies. We never weren't enemies, bud. We just held hands for a bit. I can feel my heart racing. Working together with those two is strangely exhilarating. <laughs> yeah, again, this is why you know, Odette gets off on this stuff. Following that, the three of us all go our separate ways. Being able to work together with those two as equals has given me strength. Did they give you a, a taxi fare to get back home? I always thought we belonged in different worlds, but that's not the case. They may outclass me when it comes to physical prowess and combat ability, but I proved that we can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe when it comes to our determination. Let's do this. Those words represent my determination. And here we go. There are a number of terms used to describe the sequence of events that led to a specific outcome. Some call it life, others call it a story. One is responsible for much during this sequence, such as choices picked, relationships built, and mistakes made. All for the sake of proceeding along a predetermined path. That is the natural order of a world ruled by the concept of fate. Fate never strays from its course, regardless of how cruel it may be. There was a time when I truly believed all that, but now I know. You don't just let fate run its course, you shoulder it yourself. That's why I'm going to settle the score. I'll change fate itself. I make my way to the station closest to Tokyo Tower, and then take the train to Shinjuku. I wonder if, uh, I mean... Again, the, the obvious is predictable. Is she going to try to fight that? Is she going to take Sonia's words to heart? And find some way to... I don't know, do the unexpected. We, we still have to vote you out. We don't have a choice. It's the only way to bring Naomi back. But what's going to happen along the way? Once there, I rushed to where this all began. The place that led to me losing my life. I've been here a number of times since Divine Selection began. This is the time that truly matters, though. There he is. The train is already sitting at the platform. The signal for its immediate departure rings out just as I spot him. Ah, there he is, in his, uh, his get-up from back then. He's in disguise today as well, from what I can tell. I can barely make out his outline from here, but I know it's him. The hair, those rabid eyes, and the keychain on his bag. Those all stood out. We still need to hear the story on that keychain. Does that tie into the, the regret? He seems to have noticed me. His cold gaze sends a shiver down my spine. It's possible he's been waiting here for my arrival. In fact, that's definitely the case. He turns and boards the train. I jump into the car closest to me so I don't miss it. Can you travel between cars on these kind of trains? I feel like you can. Although the train isn't packed due to it being a Sunday, there's still a decent number of passengers. Enough for all the seats to be taken, and leave a good amount of people standing. I need to hurry. Things kicked off not long after leaving Shinjuku, Shinjuku on that fateful day. That's why I run toward the car that you boarded, paying no mind to the people I bump into along the way. I'm moving toward the front car, it's the same direction that the train is moving in. The situation has already escalated by the time I reach my destination, however. Oh, is he doing something else? Is he 
taking the train itself hostage. He's not just sitting there waiting for a chat. You opens his bag the exact moment I arrive. Are we going to have a chat in the middle of a fire? Run! I scream at the other passengers on instinct. I can't say for sure how many hear me. The lack of any significant reaction tells me it has to have been very few. I mean, where are they going to run? That's not my problem, though. There's only one thing for me to do here. You took your time. You was tossed as disguise. His face is recognizable by the entire country after yesterday's stream. Oh, that, yeah, can that get you to run? Those who see him immediately understand their situation. In that sense, his presence alone proves to be far more effective than my warning. What are you planning? I told you, I'm settling the score with fate. You won't be able to kill anyone now, even if you let that bomb go off. I'm lucky that he didn't opt to do anything wild right away. Nothing was stopping him from letting the bomb go off right then and there. That's fine. All that matters is that you're here now. I'm aware of what you want. Are, are we? Truly? I stand tall as I confront him. The passengers in our car gradually make their way to another one. Someone tries to grab my arm to help me escape as well, but I brush them off. You might detonate the bomb if he thinks I'm trying to escape. I have no intention of doing so. If he wants to settle the score, then I'm all for it. You want to become a hero, not as a puppet, but as your own person. So I wasn't hearing things after all. We didn't even have our card books back then, and yet we understood each other. Odd, considering I could barely comprehend Japanese back then. <laughs> it's only been another month, buddy. Doesn't matter. Surely you're not satisfied with just me being here. It's your fault everything ended up like this. You should have killed me before. That's why I'm here now. You're not the only one trying to settle things. My memories were gradually coming back to me as I spent time with Shigetsugu. I slowly came to remember everything about myself. My past, my desperation, and more importantly, my true nature. That's why I begged you to eliminate me. I don't have a normal life to go back to after this. I'm not like you. You had a normal life with Shigetsugu, though. You two are like family. And I've ended off worse off for it. If I had to lose anything, it should have been my conscience. I wouldn't have had to worry about anything then. I would have been nothing more than a mindless machine built to kill. Having my eyes open to what a normal life looked like made me revisiting my past that much more painful. I don't want that feeling. All you had to do was find your own way to live. I can't. Shigetsugu never taught me how. He never felt the need to. He honestly believed that you would manage. He wanted you to decide how you would live your life on your own. That's what the money he left behind was for. I'm not sure we actually got that money. He's asking too much of me. No, he's not. It was your choice to become a puppet in the first place, wasn't it? I'm not a puppet. Then prove it. That's why I'm doing this. I'll become a hero after you kill me. Tell me, what's a hero to you? To me, it sounds like nothing more than some tall tale of your own design. A hero is someone who gives their life to accomplish something. Someone who in death becomes timeless. Everything I've done after Shigetsugu was eliminated was by my own will. Going back to my old work. Making a stand against the world. Taking what's important to you is all part of it. I want you to kill me, so I killed someone close to you first. I did this of my own volition. I'll prove that I'm not just some puppet. I feel myself about to scream when he brings up Naomi. I can't let it out though, I have to hold it in. I'm pretty sure he means everything he said. That's why all I feel for him now is pity. I know that I shouldn't. I mean, it makes no sense to feel sorry for the person who killed Naomi. And you, by the way. I convinced myself that the story he told at Tokyo Tower meant nothing to me. But still. Who is a great hero to you, then? Well, his mama. I have to ask him. A great hero to me? Mama, of course. Who else could it be? What was it she provided for you, then? I'm sure it was the same thing as Shigetsugu. Huh? What did Mama give me? Shigetsugu wanted you to become a person who could provide something for another. A desire she likely shared. And that something wasn't fear or despair, much less anger or sadness. No one would wish for that. You understand that, don't you? I... You knew Shigetsugu considered you both kind and brave. That's why you accepted the name he gave you. You want to become the person he saw. That's why you're still using that name even now. Only your name card didn't disappear. That's more than enough proof that deep down you don't want to become this kind of hero. Quit running and face yourself already. Shut up! Just shut up! He cuts me off with a rabid scream. There is more to it than just his words, though. His animosity toward me is palpable. He's become nothing more than a desperate child. It's almost like his regret and my regret are the same regret. Our regret was losing our regular life. His regret is the fact that he never had one. 
He rips his bag open while screaming. Inside is the exact same bomb he used on the day we died. I mean, what's this going to do if everyone's run away? If it's a firebomb, then, I mean, grats on setting the train on fire. Neither of us are going to care. There's that shot. I saw this picture. Well, don't do it. Well, looks a little too late. He's not doing this to kill others. He's trying to hurt himself. This is his solution to escape the contradiction within himself. I dash toward him in response. I do it instinctively. My reasoning behind my action doesn't matter right now. Don't be so rash! I... Is she gonna try to save him? I can make it before he triggers the bomb. I'm not sure you can. That CG implies you can't. Just as I think that, the train lurches violently. The speakers announce that they have engaged the emergency brakes. Someone must have pressed the emergency, emergency stop button after fleeing this train car. As a result, I throw all my weight back in order to keep myself from face planting as I run at you. The recoil on top of the shift throws me back against the door connecting this car and the next. We're that close to it? I turn my gaze back to you after making sense of what just happened, only to find that I'm too late. Yep, there it goes. A thunderous roar resounds, accompanied by a blinding light. How hurt actually are we? This is a scene embedded deep within my psyche. Yep, welcome back. I close my eyes as the explosion goes off. Fortunately, I get away with just a cut on my leg due to both the distance and the fact that you is smothering the bomb when he set it off. And the fact that I have a protective parka. Then again, it might be due to divine selection working to protect me as a participant. That too. And again, what's he going to be like? He got a small cut as well. From the last bomb. I wonder if these little tiny cuts are going to be symbolic of something. The flames from the explosion envelop the car just like they did before. The heat wave causes my vision to blur. I can feel the discomfort on my skin from the intense heat too. It's the same scene I witnessed before. The scene undone by divine selection. What happened to you? I knew it. I can't die. Well, at least it damaged your clothes this time. Last time I didn't even do that. I turn my eyes from you the moment he enters my line of sight. The explosion has roasted him alive. Fragments of the bomb are lodged in his body, exposing raw muscle. He's bleeding profusely. Okay, you must just have been not that close to the other bomb before... Not much protection. Your parka has failed. I only look upon him for a second, but I will never forget that sight. The smell of burnt flesh wafts through the car with the smoke. I look back toward him slowly. Come here, you. I can help you before it's too late. I mean, he'll be okay. What do you have to gain by helping me? The heat, I feel, is nothing compared to what it must be like around you, who's at the locus of the explosion. I try to make my way over to him, but my body refuses to move. Yu's card book, which remains completely unscathed, lay at his feet. I would have expected it to catch fire, but there it is, perfectly fine. Well, that'll survive no matter what. Is it about, a, is it about to light up from something? The tattered and scorched remains of Yu's bag lay beside it. The keychain has been damaged a bit, but it's more or less survived the blast. You picks it up ever so slowly. That's going to be pretty hot. I brought the bag along with this keychain the very first day I got to Japan. I didn't think much of it at the time. But when you took it from me at Tokyo Tower, I felt like I had to get it back. It had become important to me at some point. At some point, during the time I spent with Shigetsugu. Tell me later! Just get over here, now! I don't know why I'm worried about him. All I need to do is learn his regret. But I can't settle down seeing him like this. Shigetsugu never locked the door when someone was home, but he would whenever we were out. That's true, we notice that quite often. You lock the door when you leave and unlock it when you come home. That's common sense to you. I wanted that to be the case for me as well. I only realized it once Shigetsugu was gone, though. Once that desire of mine became unattainable. If possible, I wanted to live a normal life, like all of you. My card book begins to shine. Yep. Not that I'm in any position to check it right now. I drag myself as close to him as I can before extending my hand. The unseen wall of heat around him pushes against me. The sweat built up on my arm evaporates before it has the chance to drip off me. That doesn't matter right now! Now, you can... Finally kill me. You! 
A gust of smoke surrounds him all of a sudden. Probably because a swell of air just got sucked into the car when a window broke. The flames grow more intense. I can't even keep my eyes open. The amount of smoke causes me to crouch without thinking. I must be trying to keep myself from breathing it in. My right hand remains extended toward you, though. Is he going to take it? Is he going to do something for someone else? Is he going to get to have that joy that Shigetsugu wanted him to have and that his mama wanted him to have? It's the one part of my body I can still control willingly. I feel something solid touch it. Thank you, Rinka. I'm not sure if he speaks after touching my hand or if I imagine it. Regardless, I feel my consciousness fade from the suffocating heat. I give in to it and pass out. And I need to wrap this up here. But uh, we have had yet another very eventful day. And, uh, well, we've got you stuff. We're going to vote him off this time. We're going to bring back our girl Naomi. We're going to see what else happens. What the hell was Team 9 up to? I'm going to be curious what their, uh, what their actions were over the weekend. They were supposedly doing stuff around you, but, uh, no, I guess they just sat around drinking and talking about how cool they were. And Federico was hitting on Miharu, and maybe they ordered some more pancakes. Anyway, we'll go ahead and wrap things up now. And we'll really, really, really wrap things up during the next session. And after we take care of you, what's going to happen then? Who's the focus going to be after that? We're going to go after Alan. We're going to go after Odette. Is the other alliance going to fall apart? What's going to change? Who's going to be the target next time? Well, we'll find out. Thanks for sticking with the series so long. I'm enjoying this, and I'm enjoying making it. I'll see you next time.